And during the webinar, please type questions and comments into the questions panel on the sidebar, and we will uh, address those questions in the second half of the webinar. So with that, why don't we get started? Tony, how are you today? I'm doing fine, thank you. Excellent. And, uh, and, and where are you today, Tony? Um, I'm actually uh, traveling on the road, and I'm down in Monterey, Mexico. Fantastic. That sounds very, very interesting, very cool. Yeah. Excellent. Well, uh, why don't you take it away? Okay. So the, the title of the talk I'm going to give today is called Personalization and the Rise of Individualized Experiences. And, and this is, you know, if you're familiar with personalization, this isn't anything new per se. Um, but what is new is how customer experience professionals are using some of the techniques marketers have traditionally used to personalize offers, recommendations, messages, uh, but use those same techniques and tools um, to personalize the experience itself. Um, and when I say personalize the experience, I mean sort of the functionality, the core content, the types of features and functions that customers experience um, when they're engaging with the brand. And this is sort of really sort of transforming the types of experiences that are being created um, and the value that's being delivered by them. And I'm going to talk about that. And, and at Forrester, we kind of tend to call these things this, this new trend, individualization. And I'll get into some of the particulars of that in my talk. All right. Oops. Go back. Sorry. So today I'm going to talk about specific things. One is just this notion that customer data comes of age. Um, attitudes are, from customers around personal data are changing and evolving. There's new sets of expectations around personalization and experiences that are really making it possible and feasible for people to use um, this sort of intimate customer data to drive experiences. And I'll talk about that. I'll also talk about what are individualized experiences, give you concrete examples of how different companies in a variety of different industries are individualizing their experiences. And I'll also sort of touch on how to get started. What are some tips if you're interested in going down this road that you can start taking into account as you move from personalization towards individualization? All right, so customer data comes of age. Um, it used to be back in the day, um, experiences tended to be pretty personal. If you think about sort of a general store, you tended to have a pretty intimate relationship with the person serving you. They knew who you were. They perhaps knew some history, your buying history, where you lived, perhaps even family members, your preferences, your attitudes about products. And they were able to give you a fairly high level of personalization in that experience. Um, unfortunately, that world no longer exists. That simply isn't how we interact with brands today. Uh, customers interact with brands across a vast and even growing range of touch points. Those touch points are not only sort of digital online touch points, right? Emails, online ads, reviews, search engines, apps, websites, kiosks, and so forth. Um, but those touch points are still some of those more traditional ones, sort of those offline analog touch points, if you will. Right? We still see print materials, billboards, we still interact with sales associates, we go into retail stores. Um, you get on planes and stay in hotels. These things aren't disappearing. Um, but what happens is, you know, there's just this profusion of new touch points that exist that all have to be in sync to deliver a great experience. Um, now, because there are so many of these touch points, and even the analog ones tend to have digital connectivity into them and to some extent, what is happening is that customer experience professionals now have access to just this enormous abundance of customer data that they never had in the past. And it goes beyond simple profile information of who the customer is, what their demographics or ownership history is, but it gets into their behaviors. How are they interacting or transacting with the company, the brand, what are sort of the attitudes or perceptions around those interactions. It gets into context and attitudes, where they are, what they're doing, what their environment is like. Um, also, sentiment data, affinity networks, who they're related to, who they're connected to in that, that network, what they're expressing in terms of social media, and even in some cases, the content of their own documents, their own materials, right? You see applications looking at your calendar, looking at your email accounts, looking if you have Google, it looks at your Google Drive, um, other types of areas. And customers sort of have this notion now that brands really do have access to this enormous amount of information and their attitudes around it are, in some sense are changing. Um, a survey of 20 to 40 year olds in the US and UK found that 73 percent of them prefer to do business with brands that use their information to make experiences more efficient. 
Um, this is a bit of a change. Several years ago, there was a bit of a hostility from customers around knowing that companies are collecting this personal data. As customers come to understand that companies can use this data very um, progressively to really improve the experience, to deliver things that are more relevant to them, those attitudes have really softened. And we actually now see a lot of customers who sort of feel that companies should be taking advantage of this information to give them a better experience, not so they have to experience a generic one, but something that's much more tailored and aligned to what they want. Um, among U.S. online adults, 18 and over, 57% said they don't even have a problem with providing personal information as long as it's for their benefit. And that notion of for their benefit really is a key essential thing here. Um, what you don't want to have is companies collecting information and using it for their own purposes. Um, this is a, um, a story that ran in The Onion, which is kind of a humor um, newspaper magazine online. And they wrote this kind of story in reaction to this idea that companies are collecting information on customers for their own purposes. And so the, the title of this, this article that they ran was More Corporations Using Tag and Release Programs to Study American Customers. And then the caption on the photograph here is a Procter & Gamble marketing team attaches a tracking collar to an, an incapacitated head of a household specimen. When you collect information on customers and don't sort of have the quid pro quo of we're collecting this information to provide a better ex experience to you as a customer, but rather we're just collecting this information for our own purposes to study you or to, or to profit off of your own information by selling it onto third parties and so forth. It creates a very sort of negative experience for customers. They are okay with you collecting information on them if they know that information is actually coming back to benefit them and that experience that they're achieving. And when they don't, they really start to feel like a lab animal and that really is a big turnoff for them. Um, and in fact, when you do use that, um, that does sort of have a positive impact on that experience. 62% of U.S. online adults, they've chosen um, brands, they've recommended brands, and they've even paid more for brands that provide that personalized level of service or experience. So, you know, if you are using it for their benefit, there's a very lot of positive um, connection there with the customers. And that's why, you know, to some extent, personalization and marketing has to one degree has been very successful. Um, personalized messages, offers, recommendations, these things aren't new. Companies like Amazon have been doing them for years. Um, Sephora, other retailers are also doing it. Um, and one of the reasons they're doing it is because it tends to be quite successful. Um, and there's a quite a long track record, documented history of the benefits of doing this type of personalization in that marketing domain. Um, Experian, they were using personalization um, in their emails and they saw six times higher transaction rates as a result of it. The retailer Rula Law, um, they were using personalization on, on their experience and they saw 15% higher conversion rates, product discovery, revenue per visitor, um, a whole host of metrics that had some, some positive uplift as a result of personalizing that experience. Uh, Publishers Clearinghouse, they saw a 19% lift in customer acquisition simply by personalizing the messages and offers they're giving to customers. Um, now, there is this notion of personalization as a marketing technique, and as I referred to at the very beginning, that you know that's not necessarily new. People have been doing this for years, uh, but customer experience professionals are starting to use those same techniques to drive sort of this new dimension, which is called individualization. And I'll sort of contrast that a little bit. When we talk about personalization, what we're really talking about is trying to drive specific marketing-driven outcomes higher response rates, conversion rates, sales type figures. Um, and that's what, the mar that's what the personalization is really driven towards. They tend to use it in terms of segments or cohorts of customers to aggregate them together, to give them a message that resonates with them. And again, you're, they're really trying to affect the offers, the, the recommendations, the marketing messages that are going out. With individualization, it, it's, it's extending those capabilities into a new realm. So rather than trying to drive desirable actions or behaviors around those marketing metrics. With individualization, customer experience professionals are looking to use those techniques to improve the customer experience itself. And when I say that, I mean driving higher customer satisfaction, um, driving increased relevance, reducing customer effort um, as, they pr as they interact with brands. Um, and rather than looking at it in terms of segments or cohorts, 
they're really driving towards individuals and using that individual level data to do this. Um, and that's how you really get to that increased level of relevance um, and less customer effort. And the types of things they're really trying to affect are that core functionality of the website, the, the digital app, the experience itself. They're looking at the core content of that experience, not necessarily the marketing content, which tends to be an overlay on that experience, but the actual content that people are there to, to purchase or absorb or use in that experience. And also just the interactions that go on, the types of features and functions that are being built into that experience. Um, so more concretely, what are individualized experiences? Well, at Forrester, uh, we define individualized experiences as experiences that use customer data to structure interaction, functionality, and content around the needs of individual customers. And that really manifests itself in a couple different ways. When you think about these hallmarks of how that happens, there are four of them. The first one, which is really aligned with those traditional marketing practices, is around tailored suggestions. This is using that customer data to increase engagement and conversion through targeted marketing recommendations, offers, and messages. The second way they do that is by reprioritizing interactions. This is about proactively reshaping the experience and functionality of the site using that customer data to provide a better fit for customer behaviors um, and align them to their needs in the moment. The fourth area is around curated content. This is about eliminating or prioritizing specific content on the site to improve discovery and relevance. And the fourth one is around systematized guidance. And this is really combining customer data with AI engines, with uh, expert systems, with rule-based systems, even other third-party data sources to provide intelligent services and experiences that weren't possible before. And I'm going to deep dive into each of these and give you some very specific examples of how companies are doing this. So let's look at tailored suggestions first. And again, these aren't necessarily new. You're probably very familiar with these and have seen these for quite some time. Um, Uncommon Goods, the retailer, they look at your browsing behavior. They look at the products you're looking at. And they use that information to then surface product recommendations that are relevant to you. Again, this isn't anything new. Amazon does this for years, even decades, they've been looking at doing this. Um, but this is sort of at the very surface level, very rudimentary level of personalization. The difference is, is they're starting to get down to the individual level. Rather than looking at a cohort, they're looking specifically at the products you are looking at and using that to drive those recommendations rather than lumping you into a broader segment. Caribou Coffee, um, they do a very similar thing, and but they connect it a little broader. So they know if on one visit you were looking at pumpkin um, flavored um, coffee or desserts, they sort of use that as a way to, to feature content on your next visit, on future visits, to suggest things that perhaps are relevant to you then. The key thing here is that they're really having that continuity from experience to experience, that there has a sense of this longevity of when you experienced it one time, you're going to come back again and again, and how do you carry that information forward in a progressive way so you're personalizing future experiences based on what they had done in the past. Um, a little more sophisticated in this realm is 7-Eleven, and what's unique about what they're doing is their, their mobile app is actually pulling in lots of different data sources that perhaps you don't even think about. So it'll pull in literally your GPS location of where you are. It'll look at the weather conditions in that location. So is it hot? Is it cold? They'll look at time of day. Is it morning? Is it afternoon? Is it late evening? Um, and they use that in conjunction with other data to really surface offers that really are relevant to you in that very specific um, moment. Um, and what's unique about this is also that you know they have hundreds or thousands of offers they could put in front of you, but they're really tailoring it down to which offers are relevant based on where you are, what the nearest 7-Eleven actually has to offer, that time of day, what the weather's like. And so if it's a cold evening, they may be suggesting things like hot coffee instead of soda. Um, and if it's sort of mid-afternoon or mid-morning when somebody might want a little snack in between meals, they're offering things like little chicken fingers that you can come in and purchase at that moment. The idea here is to really make the offers and recommendations much more relevant to them on, on data that goes beyond simply personal preferences, that preferences change depending on context, and context can drive a lot of that recommendation. And so they've pulled in that contextual information as another information layer that they are using to then drive even more relevant 
recommendations for those customers. Um, Reprioritize interactions. Remember, this is about reshaping the functionality based on what customer behaviors and needs are. Um, a great example of a company doing this is Wells Fargo and their ATM experience. Um, if you've sort of used ATM machines, which I'm sure most of you on the, call, the phone are, um, the interface is largely the same from every um, bank out there. It's the same interface that they've been using for 15, 20 years. It hasn't really changed much in terms of a hierarchical tree that you navigate through. Um, Wells Fargo has really kind of flipped that on its head and said, hey, we could individualize this experience for every single one of our customers. And so what they do is they go in and they look at your transaction history and they isolate your two most common transactions and all of the preferences that go along with that. So for example, if you the most common thing you do when you go to the ATM machine is to get $60 fast cash from your checking account um, with, uh, with an email receipt, they'll take that functionality, encapsulate it in a single button and put it on the interface. And that's kind of what you see here on the top. These two green buttons represent the two most common transactions that that specific customer does. And those buttons are different for every customer at Wells Fargo. Uh, in addition to that, they then look at all the other functions on the, that customers access on the ATM machine, and then they prioritize them based on how frequently they, they do those. So if you frequently do deposits on the ATM machine, that functionality, that button is higher up in the interface. If you're a common person who buys stamps at that ATM machine, that function will actually rise up in that interface to make it more relevant. And then they also acknowledge that there's information that people, everybody tends to do every time they go to the ATM machine. And why should they force people to actually go through menu options to access that information? So in this case, they simply surface account balances. They are right there on the home screen after you enter your PIN number. If you use their monthly budget tracker, which some of their customers do, that information is surfaced right there. So you can see it as soon as you come in. So you don't have to go access that information. It really saves customers a lot of time. Um, and this is really kind of creates this very deeply personal ATM experience for the customer that's really tailored to their needs, to their behaviors, to their types of interactions. Um, and Wells Fargo even goes a little bit beyond that um, in terms of personalization or individualization. One of the, the interesting things they do is during the month of your birthday, um, while transactions are processing, they will put up a happy birthday message to you. Um, and now you may think that this is kind of a trivial, kind of almost silly type of feature that they've added and it doesn't really add much to the experience, but you'd really be wrong. Um, in social media, this is the number one thing that they get the most tweets, the most social media mentions about from their customers. Um, when they rolled out this feature, they didn't think customers would want to see it all month, and so they simply showed it a couple times and then retired the message. They actually had customers calling in and sending them messages asking where my happy birthday message went, and they had to re-change the software to actually show it during the entire month of their birthday. And so it definitely is a big part of how they've personalized and in some sense humanized that experience. They've realized that going in to see a teller and having that personal connection with a person behind the counter no longer exists. The way in which their customers interact with their brand is through this ATM machine. That's the number one channel in which customers interact with them. And how do you humanize and make that a more intimate experience for those customers? These types of features that they've began baking into their ATM machines are their way of doing that, of humanizing and recognizing that you're just not an account to them, but you're an individual and they're reflecting those preferences, those behaviors, those choices, um, that information about you in that interface for those customers. Um, another way you can reprioritize functionality, um, this is from JetBlue and they're not the only ones who do this, most airline applications do this now. Um, but based on upcoming flights, time of day, some are even using location to do this, um, they will literally change the home screen of that app interface. And so rather than simply just having that menu of options, when you have that up and coming flight that morning or that afternoon, it will surface information about that flight. It will surface that boarding pass for you. It's changing the narrative of how you migrate through that application based on what's relevant and important in that moment. Chances are, if you're going into that app the morning before a flight, you want to look up information on that flight. You want to see if it's delayed. You want to get checked in. Um, you perhaps even want to access other information about it. But they surface that information immediately for the customer to make it easier for them to interact with that application. That's In a sense, they're reprioritizing the functionality to surface functions that are relevant to the customer at that moment. 
Um, Walmart does this similarly, but in a different way. Um, Walmart's mobile app, when you're out and about, when you're at home, it, it looks kind of like their web experience. It's a typical store where you can go and you can browse and shop and purchase products. The unique thing is that when you actually enter a Walmart store, the app actually senses that you enter the store and the application literally flips. They call it flipping and you can actually see the little button down there at the middle um, bottom of the interface and you could kind of manually do this, but the interface will literally flip over and what you'll then get when you enter that store is an experience that is really tailored to that sto in-store experience. So rather than simply have a catalog of all their products, you can now get an in-store map. You could search for products in-store and get directions to them. You can see specials for that store that you're in. And functionality that's only usable in the store, for example, the scan and go functionality, where you can scan products as you're, you're taking them off the shelf, so you can kind of skip the checkout line when you're ready to leave the store. That functionality now becomes available to customers in that context. And then when you leave the store, it reverts back to that more traditional web-like experience where you're simply browsing an online store to purchase goods. Um, this is a great example of acknowledging that contact, that context, the types of functions and features people want in that context, and making that happen based on that personal information. Um, Harrison Hool is also another interesting case, and this is a good example of um, different customers want different types of personalization, that there isn't just one form of personalization that fits everyone. And so Harrison Hool, if you're not familiar with them, it's a competitor to Starbucks in the UK, very similar, you know, coffee house type experience, all those same types of things Starbucks offers. In their mobile app, you can actually do all that same stuff you could do at Starbucks. You could pre-order your, your drink, your coffee, whatever it is. You could pay for it. You simply go there and pick it up. But one of the things Harrison Hool recognized is that this purely digital experience where people come into the, the, to the store to get their coffee or their muffin and not interact with the employees, that wasn't particularly a desirable experience for all their customers. Some of those customers still wanted to have a personal connection or interaction with the in-store staff. Um, because they didn't like this idea of just simply these people serving them as anonymous people behind the counter. They wanted to have a human experience. And so what Harris Hool has enabled is when you sign up, you can opt in for this more personal level experience. And what you do is you take a selfie of yourself um, and you add that to your account. And when you walk into a Harrison Hool shop now, what happens on the employee screen is up will pop a picture of you with your name, with your preferred um, drink or your order that you typically have at that moment or that time of the day. And then when you walk up to the counter, the employee can address you by name and say, hi, Tony, I, good morning, how are you doing? Um, would you like your usual latte this morning? You can simply say yes. That um, associate who is helping you will simply tap the screen. The payment information is already there. The order is automatically placed and that, ex that transaction is executed. It's that little bit of human connection that really makes that a special experience for those customers who really want to have that human connection. And they've used the technology to enable this more personal level of experience um, for, that, for that set of customers. And that's a really important thing to think about because not all customers want the same type of personalized experience. You need to be able to accommodate that in different situations. Um, the third hallmark or, or, or type of individualization is this notion of curated content. And again, this is thinking about all the content, all the, the, the content you'd have on your site or your application, even all the features and functions. How do you sort of eliminate um, those items which aren't relevant to me or prioritize the ones that are? And that's what this is really about. It's about really improving discovery and the relevance of what you put in front of customers themselves. A company that does this uh, in, a, in a very compelling way is True and Company. You may not have heard this company. Uh, this is a, a startup that actually was designed or created to help women that to find bras that actually fit them. Um, if if you're a man, you probably don't think this is a big issue, but actually, as a garment, a bra is the most complicated garment to actually fit on a person. Um, there are a number of different variables and dimensions and other aspects of getting a, the right fit. It's something women typically struggle with. And so they've actually designed an entire site to optimize that experience. And what they do is when you register for the service, they have you fill out a quite lengthy questionnaire that asks very specific questions about the bras you have and different fit issues you have. And it literally gets into very sort of nuanced um, aspects of fit. Um, of shape, of size, of products you have that do fit, and they use all of this information they collect about customers 
to then create a customized store specifically for you as a customer. You don't see the entire inventory of what they have to offer. You simply see the products that are relevant to you. And to give you an idea of this model and how sophisticated it is, um, they have samples from over 500,000 women. They have millions of data points as a result. They've actually identified over 5,000 different body shapes and sizes that they categorize their products into to create this matching algorithm for customers. And one other aspect of their services, if you do get a product that you want to return that perhaps it didn't fit you, when you return it, they have also this fairly in-depth questionnaire that they have going, that they have you fill out that gets at specific reasons of why that bra didn't fit you. And they use that to then optimize and train that engine more. And sometimes it even helps them surface issues that perhaps they weren't even aware of. One of the things they kind of discovered, which kind of surprised them because the company was largely run and, and created by women, um, but even they didn't really think about it, um, was this notion of padded bras that they never thought to include that as a question in their upfront survey. And it turned out, um, as they were looking at the returns data, customers have this very sort of, um, you know, strong preference one way or other for padded bras. And sort of knowing that and learning that from the returns data, they actually factored that back into the initial survey they gave women when they signed up for the service. And that allows them to tune their engine even better for them. And you might think adding all these questions to the survey, the sign up process being more laborious, um, they thought when people signed up for the service, a shorter survey would be better. Um, well, what they found is as they removed questions to make the survey shorter and simpler, um, their completion rates actually decreased. Um, people didn't find it easier. And as they add more questions to the survey that, that highlight very specific issues customers have, they actually see completion rates increase as a result of that. And what's actually happening is customers then have the confidence to know you're asking the right questions that hit on issues I specifically have as a customer. And because of that, you're probably going to be able to give me a much better recommendation or suggestion in terms of a product than if you're simply asking superficial questions about that product category. Um, so they found this to be tremendously successful. They've actually even gone into doing custom manufacturing where they created their own line of products um, to create um, bras and lines of products to, to that are better suited towards the actual data they're getting from women on fit. Um, another company that started doing this interesting thing around curating content is Google. Um, their Google Now product really is kind of this, this engine that does that. It really curates content, web searches in particular, to find and surface information customers need in the moment. So they know um, just from their browsing history that, for example, when you wake up in the morning, a lot of people are searching for traffic information. They're searching for weather information. If you have sports teams that you follow, people tend to follow the scores as the games are progressing. And so rather than having customers go off and find this information on their own, they can learn this information about customers and they created this Google Now engine to basically surface that information for the customers in the moment. So if you go in there, it's going to have those sports scores if that game's on. If it's you have a meeting coming up, it's going to pop up traffic information, directions on how to get to that location. If you have a flight coming up, it's going to surface that boarding pass. Um, it's really sort of automating a lot of these routine um, um, experiences, these routine search experiences that they can in some sense anticipate and predict based on what they know about you and your calendar and your preferences and your browsing history and your behaviors. Um, and they're really using that to sort of drive that experience. Um, Edward Jones, the, the investment advisory or, um, company, they sort of are doing this in a little more of a subtle way. When you're on their site and, for example, you search for specific um, advisors on their site, the next time you return to the site, they're actually surfacing that information and kind of rearranging the content of the site around what they know about your browsing history in the past to tailor that experience to you. Um, it's a little more subtle in terms of how they're doing it. It's not as sophisticated, perhaps, as what Google or True and Company are doing. But I wanted to give you an example of that. You know, the core content of the site of what you're putting in front of customers can also sort of be evolved and and um, curated using some of this personal data and in, in a more subtle type of experience. The fourth area. Um, that people are sort of doing individualization around is this notion of systematized guidance. 
And this is when you really take customer data, you combine it with AIs, expert systems, rules-based engines, other third-party data sources, um, and really creating new types of services that weren't possible before this, this information was available. For example, the Weather Channel has this application called The Outsider. It's for runners, and what they've recognized is that when you, if you are passionate about running, there are certain factors in terms of the weather, they call them biometeorological factors, which actually impact human performance. Some runners prefer to run in hot and humid weather. Some prefer it in sort of cold, wet um, weather. People perform differently in these different sorts of conditions. They've identified those conditions, and what the app does is it tracks your run history, creates correlations between your run performance and weather conditions at, during that run, and then they use that information to then give you a run forecast into the future. So they can tell you your next best optimal time to go running is Thursday morning, and then the next window after that is going to be Sunday afternoon. And those are going to be the times when you're going to be have your best performance if you go and run during those periods. It's this combination of this inf tracking information they have about you and your runs combined with what they know about the weather and human performance, and they can give you this new level of recommendation around that. And this simply wasn't possible before without having access to these sorts of data. Facebook does a sort of a similar thing. With, um, for marketers who are placing ads on their site. They'll look at things like conversion rates and click-throughs and engagement of those advertisements. They'll look at it in relation to other advertisers who are doing similar things. They have an engine that'll sort of go through and make intelligent recommendations to you to help you to optimize those campaigns that you're placing to get a better result. And in some sense, they've sort of automated a lot of the intelligence that you need to be a marketer and helped you, helping you predict how to get a better result by placing ads of certain types with certain groups or, or um, who you're exposing to that information. Um, lastly, Nest Labs Learning Thermostat is another great example of this, this um, systematized guidance. What the, the thermostat will do is it'll take your preference information, so literally you can say if this is too hot, too cold, it'll sort of learn those preferences over time. It'll sense your activity in your house. It'll look at the time of day. It'll look at the weather. It'll look at the season. Out. Um, it'll even look at energy utility pricing at different points of the day. And it'll factor all of those things in together to give you sort of an optimal um, sort of heating and cooling system or experience that also achieves your goal of minimizing your expense. And so it gives you the best experience you could possibly have at the lowest possible cost it can achieve um, within those parameters. And in this sense, they've used this intelligent engine to combine all of these different factors to deliver this new type of experience to customers that is highly personal, highly individualized, and even adapts as your behaviors change throughout the week. If you go on vacation, or perhaps different people live with you, you have different children, or your routines change, it'll adapt and evolve with that um, in real time in reaction to what you're doing. There's nothing more you need to do. It simply becomes self-aware of that environment and adapts accordingly. Um, all of these types of individualized experiences that I've mentioned are really sort of raising the bar in terms of how companies think about quality. And it does it in a few specific ways. One is this idea of proactivity. Um, customers are increasingly expecting brands' applications to really be more proactive in fetching information that's relevant and prioritizing functionality of surfacing things that are more relevant to them, to be more active participants in that experience rather than simply being menus of functions that customers can access, but the customers have to drive it. In this sense, the applications, the experiences are becoming more active participants in that experience rather than pa part passive um, observers or order takers. The other thing is around re relevance. It's about surfacing and prioritizing, about eliminating content that isn't relevant to the customers in that moment. It helps improve that as you go. It also um, focuses on continuity of experience. This recognition that I may engage with one channel, I'm, next time I engage with you it might be another way. If I'm on your website and I'm looking at something and then I call your 1-800 number to inquire about more information, having that continuity of experience where that customer service representative actually knows what I was looking at on that web page and is able to use that information to preserve me better in that moment. It's that continuity as I move across time and across channels and being able to preserve that 
because customers don't like the idea of having to repeat themselves or give you information. If they gave it that information to you on the website, they expect your customer service representative to know that as well. Um, and when you don't do that, that's a really frustrating experience because you force the customer to actually be the, the gap filler in your experience. You force the customer to connect the dots for you when you have that information and you should be more proactive about connecting those dots in the first place. Try the next slide. Oops. The slide's not advancing. I'm not sure what's going on. I'm sorry, the slide isn't. We're on, the, um, we're on the how to get started slide right now. Oh, let me go back a couple. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe you can manually advance to um, after continuity. For some reason, my slides aren't updating. Yep, so emotional engagement. Yep, and so just as Wells Fargo showed, there is um, this new level of emotional engagement that happens where as you get more personal, you are connecting to customers um, in a more emotionally engaging way. Um, and that's a really a, a key part of these new types of experiences that it does become more personal, it does become more individual and as you do that, that level of emotional engagement goes up because people feel more connected to it and they feel as a sense that I'm a customer, you understand me as an individual and that makes that emotion component more critical. In our customer experience index data, we looked at the importance of ease, effectiveness and emotion in driving customer loyalty. In 17 out of the 18 industries we looked at, emotion was the number one driver for customer loyalty um, of those three. Um, people tend to downplay that emotional importance, but it's critical to that customer experience you are delivering. Um, if we can sort of jump ahead to the how to get started, the first one, and I can walk you through these. I apologize, my screen isn't updating. Um, but the first thing about how to get started is if you're interested in doing this type of individualization or deepening that personalization level, there are some key things you can do to get started. Um, the first one is really knowing what metrics you're trying to drive. Um, typically when people think about personalization, they think about conversion rates, they think about increased revenue, um, increased sales and so forth. Um, that's not always the case, especially as you get into the more level of individualization around the experience. You're going to have different types of metrics. You're going to have loyalty, you're going to have retention, you're going to have customer effort as metrics. What you need to personalize in order to achieve that. Um, number two, um, you need to start with the experience and not the data or technology. Often when it comes to personalization or individualization, people jump immediately to, we have to build this enormous customer database, we need all these technology systems to connect all of this. That's not necessarily always the case. You need to think about the experience you want to deliver and then work backwards from there to say, what data do we really need to make this happen? And oftentimes, you don't need a lot of data to do it. In Wells Fargo's case, um, when they wanted to personalize their ATM machine, the data they need they already had. It was transaction logs which they had to capture anyways. They simply wrote an algorithm to go back through those transaction logs and identify for each customer what those most common transactions are that they performed and then they used that data to, to personalize, to individualize that interface for them. They didn't necessarily need to build a large technology system to support that. And so if you start with the experience, it's much easier to really identify how much technology, how much um, tools you need to actually enable this experience to happen. Number three, um, when you get started, you need to sort of think about structuring experiences around customer journeys. A lot of the challenge of individualization, of personalization, is understanding the intent of what customers are trying to do. Um, when you think about experiences from the standpoint of a customer journey, and when I say a customer journey, I think about a goal-based objective that a customer is coming to you to do. Are they trying to purchase a product? Are they trying to file a claim? Are they trying to register or, or, bot or um, engage you for a specific reason? There's an intent behind that. And once you know that intent, that makes it much easier to think about 
how you want to personalize that experience, the types of information customers are going to want, how to be proactive about surfacing functionality or capabilities that are relevant for them to achieve that goal that they have in mind. Um, number four, um, this is about having a fallback plan. So you can sort of anticipate these customer journeys, you can anticipate intent, but you really need to have some humility to recognize that you are going to get it wrong occasionally. Um, there are things that are happening in people's lives. For example, you go to purchase something at Amazon, you're not always shopping for yourself. You may be shopping for your spouse, your child, you may be buying a gift for somebody. Those purchases don't say anything about you as an individual and what you want. It says more about the person you're purchasing it from. You need to have an out where you can say, this wasn't for me, this isn't relevant in the moment to correct that engine as you go along. True and Company, which I mentioned, creates these customized stores for every customer that just shows them the products that are relevant to them. They still have an out in saying, if you don't want to look at the, what we've sort of curated for you, over here is our full store and you could browse our entire inventory of products if you really want. But the primary interface they provide is that customized store. But they've recognized that there are situations when women are going to want to look beyond that and they've enabled that capability in their experience. It's about having that fallback plan. It's having that humility to let ha customers have an out and get access to that functionality that you're not putting in front of them. Number five, um, exploring new experiences that are only possible because of digital media and data. This goes to the, that systematized guidance, the Nest um, learning thermostat, um, things like the Outsider app from the Weather Channel, from Facebook's more intelligent recommendations. Um, it's about building those types of experience. As you get more comfortable with it, you should look at doing those types of experiences because those provide new sources of value added um, value for customers that weren't possible before. So that's something to think about. And number six, um, to get started, you really need to be more agile. Um, this is very much an emerging field. There aren't large design patterns or proof of concepts of how you can sort of adopt simple best practices from other brands. You really need to find out what's right for your customers, what's right for your brand, what's right for the experience you're trying to deliver. Um, and be agile in the sense of lots of testing and learning and experimenting and having the flexibility to go back and forth. Wells Fargo, they've been doing this for several years, but they have it built into their planning cycle where sometimes they put stuff out that they think is going to resonate with customers and very quickly they realize they made a bad choice or they, they missed something in doing the design and they have to change and pivot very quickly. Um, the birthday announcement is sort of similar to that when they kind of realized very quickly that customers actually wanted to see that, they had to pivot and sort of change the design of the system to enable it to, to sort of show that birthday message all month. Um, and so you need to be a little more agile as you're doing this and take more of a, a design thinking, we're going to prototype, we're going to test, we're going to learn and evolve it over time to see what really is right for you and your company. Um, moving on to the last slide here, um, one thing I'll say about just personalization and individualization overall is this idea that uh, personalization, when it's done right, doesn't look like personalization. In some sense, it's a really a transparent thing. Personalization, when it's done right, it simply looks like a good experience from the customer's perspective. And that's really important to think about when you're doing this. That's ultimately the end goal you want. You simply want to provide a great experience. The personalization piece should be something that isn't really um, customers aren't aware of. Um, and with that, thank you. And I think we have questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Tony. That was an excellent overview. We really appreciate it. We've gotten some great questions. I, I think you've really touched on many of them, but I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and throw some out there if you have any additional comments that you wanted to make. Um, okay. Our first question is, can you dynamically change the experience based on the customer's current activity? Yeah, so if you Walmart. Yeah, the Walmart is a great example of that. Um, I'm not a Zipcar driver, but from what I've heard from Zipcar drivers is that their app will, in some sense, um, change the functionality depending on what you have. So if you don't have a reservation, I believe the app actually sort of defaults to this reserve a car nearby. Um, if you have an applicant, if you have a reservation coming up, the app will kind of default to this, you know, find my car or locate the car I'm, I'm trying to get to. If you're in the middle of a reservation, it has functionality that it surfaces around getting help or extending um, the duration of your usage of that vehicle. And so they kind of thought about what's that customer journey you go through, what stage in the journey are you at, and then how do you sort of prioritize your functionality for that moment. 
In Walmart's case, it's much more simple because the, the, the experience they've simply said is in-store or out-of-store, and how do we tailor around those two different journeys? Um, but you can think about sort of the end-to-end -end journey and what can you anticipate at all those different stages along the way. Great, yeah, that make, that makes a lot of sense. That makes. The, the, I've got another one here, and I think again you've kind of touched on it, but I'm going to ask anyway. Um, how do you propose to companies that they develop the kind of understanding about their customer that that would enable to, them to do this level of individualization? Is it is it all data and automated data, or there's some manual work like focus groups and personas and customer journeys? Yeah, so you know, big data is in vogue right now. Everybody thinks big data is going to save the day. Um, big data is very useful. It is very um, has a lot of value in terms of personalization of filtering through all of this data to look for patterns that you can apply. Um, but the problem with with it is that it's going to tell you a lot of things that are correlated, but you're not going to sh understand why it's correlated or what's really significant from a customer perspective. Um, to get to that level of perspective, you really need to engage customers themselves through either doing ethnographic research, observation, contextual inquiry, shadowing, shop-alongs, these types of things where you can really understand customer behaviors and what they're trying to do. Oh, Jesus. Motherfucker. Oh, yeah. Please hold on for one minute. I think we're having a little bit of audio issues. Um, so I'll hope that Tony can reconnect and we'll give him a couple minutes. Uh, Daniel, while we're waiting for Tony to jump back on, why don't you give some insight into the questions that you received from the audience? Hi everyone, thank you for your patience. We're having some technical difficulties. Uh, we're going to end the webinar a little short today, but please be on the lookout for our next webinar. We'll be sending emails out um, and we'll send out a recording of this webinar as well. Thank you and have a good day.